Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to a new series that I'll be running called Can You Trust Them? As the name suggests, I'll be going through different game developers, publishers or platforms and then giving them a trust score from between 0 to 100. To get to this rating, we'll look at a company's total track record, controversies, victories, state of the games they've released, how they treat customers, employees and or other game companies, how good they are at communication and listening to their audience, the monetization, the platforms they release on, mud support and then anything that's special about the company we're discussing. For now, comment below at the end of the video if you think the rating I give is fair if you think I've missed anything, or even, in this case, just your experience with Paradox Games. Without further ado, I begin this series looking at Paradox Interactive, the undisputed king of the grand strategy genre, boasting the long-running series of Crusader Kings, European Vasalis, Hearts of Iron, Victoria, and Stellaris. They are also the not-so-proud owner of the worst-reviewed thing ever to be released on Steam, the Leviathan update for EU4. In addition to developing games, Paradox is also a publisher, backing titles such as Cities Skylines and Surviving Mars. These guys are infamous for games where having 500 hours of playtime still makes you a casual. And while it can take hundreds of dollars to get all the features they've released, they do keep active support for a game running for years and years after release. As a public company listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, a developer and a publisher with a few new projects soon to be released, there is an absolute ton of information to go through. So, to start breaking it down, let's look at a brief history of Paradox Interactive as a company. And now, the company's origins began in 1980 with another firm entirely called Target Games. This was a Swedish company which focused mainly on tabletop and board games before creating their very own video games division. After a long period of hardships, Target went to bankruptcy in 1999, and from there, Paradox Entertainment spun out as a separate entity. During the period of 1999 to 2004, Paradox Entertainment made some of the more famous titles including the first Europe Universalis, Hearts of Iron, Victoria, and Crusader Kings. In 2004, the company was bought out by then-CEO Theodore Bergquist and Frederick Wester, who would later take on the role as CEO in 2009. After this purchase, Paradox Entertainment was renamed into the modern Paradox Interactive. Paradox continued to just be a games developer until around 2006 when, after taking inspiration of both Steam and the collapse of their American games distributor Strategy First, started to sell their back catalogue and downloadable content on their own website. This eventually transformed it into a fully-fledged digital storefront called Gamerscape, which exists to this day. When it first started, however, the fine gentlemen at Paradox realised that just having their own games on there wouldn't be enough to legitimise it as a reputable storefront, and so started searching out partners who would be willing to publish their games through them. The barrier to entry was pretty low just to get as many games on there as possible, so inevitably, there was a lot of trash. But there were also some notable successes, mainly the first Mountain Blade. From here, Paradox really did split its attention between development and publishing. On the development side, they had quite a few flops and buggy releases until they finally hit gold with a very well-crafted and well-tested game, Crusader Kings 2, releasing in February 2012. This was also where we first saw their current business model take shape. Paradox is known for releasing a game in a very base form and then over the years adding major updates to build on the game, including content both for free and paid DLC. For Crusader Kings 2, the major overhauls, expansions and DLC content packs have been added over the game for 7 more years after its release, with the last patch being added all the way back in mid-October 2019. While the base game is actually now free for everyone, if you want to buy all the additional content it would set you back 450 Australian dollars, a truly godless amount which isn't too bad when you spend it over 7 years, but by god does it form a barrier to entry for new players. Thankfully, this barrier to entry is only to single player for the most part, as in the multiplayer world, if the host has all the DLC, then everyone in the game has access to them as well, which is an extraordinarily generous way of doing things in the current gaming climate, so I will give them credit there where it's due. This policy applies to all of their games as well, so if you've got a friend with all the DLC and you're iffy about any of them, get them to host a game and test them for yourself. As for Paradox the Publisher, they've also done a good deal of helping out studios like Fat Shark with their one of their first titles, War of the Roses, Colossal Order with their game City Skyline, and Obsidian Entertainment of Fallout New Vegas fame with their titles Pillar of Eternity and Tyranny. Although not all their publishing dealers have gone swimmingly, with the most notable recent example being the development of Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2. Vampire was originally being created by an American company called Hardsuit Labs, but after many controversies and key personnel leaving, they were relieved of their rights to the game and development was moved in-house. 
on a business level, Paradox went public in 2016 and was initially valued at 420 million US dollars, which after years of business growth and multiple acquisitions of studios like White Wolf and intellectual property such as Prison Architect, this valuation has soared well past 1 billion USD. Although a specific number I can't find as I don't have access to a Bloomberg terminal and I can promise you that good market data is very, very, very expensive. So there we have it, a relatively simple overview of Paradox Interactive, the Swedish gaming giant. As a company they both develop and publish games, so we'll look at each of those divisions separately and then come back to our final conclusions. With that being said, let's start off with the fun stuff, their games. And before we jump into the overall mechanics, how their games released and all the objective stuff, I think it's important to first give you the feeling of what it's like to play a Paradox game, as they're almost impossible to describe. Like I said in the introduction, even with 500 hours of game time, you've barely scratched the surface a lot of the time, and truly every time you start a new game in any of the grand strategies, you get a totally new experience just through all the random events that can occur and your own increase in skill and understanding. To highlight this, I feel it's like best to mention the last time my friends and I got together to really play through Crusader Kings 2. Now for those who might be unfamiliar, CK2 gives you an historically accurate map of Europe, Arabia, India, at the steppes and Northern Africa at various start dates and then things go wild. You either play as a preset or custom character who is the head of a dynasty, and then play through feudal politics trying your best to expand your influence in the world. You can do this through conquest, assassinations or politics with one of your most important tools for all three being your children. As you're bound by the same rules at the time, only people you can trust are those in your family, so alliances can only be struck between you and anyone else through marriage. If you're not too squeamish, I'd recommend even looking up some threads about things Crusader Kings made me say, as it can involve a lot of incest, murder and praising Satan all in the name of min-maxing your family. To go back briefly to a little bit of a story, in roughly 300 odd years of history that I wrote with my friends, so much had happened through both random chance and skill it was truly staggering. The AI vassals for my viking friend was so prolific it managed to even capture Rome. My Polish friend's run died early due to his main character dying in battle and then his one and only son dying of illness shortly after. I had accidentally pissed off too many people and had a chain of characters get assassinated, and my last friend, who was based in Mali, was so prolific with his family that he couldn't actually assassinate anyone in his empire without being branded a kinslayer. I can promise you that we didn't keep track of any of all of these things, and it's impossible to do so. We'd been just focused on our own goals, and things would happen that we'd have to react to, which can be such an engaging and thrilling gameplay experience. All of that from looking at a map and pop-ups for hours at a time. Every run is always different because the worlds of Crusader Kings 2, Europa Universalis 4, Hearts of Iron 4 or Solaris are all living sandboxes that you can make your own goals within and achieve them through an excellent mixture of luck and skill. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the type of game we're dealing with. Grand strategy with a depth that's truly staggering, and what's incredible is that the actual download for most of these games is incredibly small. Crusader Kings, European of Versailles, and Huts of Iron are all 3 gig each. Only Stellaris is of any real size, totaling about 11 gig on its own. But even then, in comparison to other AAA titles, you get a lot of mileage for that small size. But I think it's also worth taking a step back and noting that the CK2 game I enjoyed playing was run on patch 3.0 with all of the DLC. This was after 7 years worth of patches and additional content, so if this is the player experience of a completed Paradox game, what would the player experience be like for a brand new release Paradox game or a base game without buying the DLC additions? Releasing a game as its basic level benefits Paradox Games as a business in that it becomes a DLC cash cow over a number of years. However, it also runs the potential of releasing something so raw in development that it's wholly disappointing and, frankly, unplayable for its fans. This is the unfortunate tale of Imperator Rome. Full disclosure, I did in fact pre-order this game and was as disappointed as most people about the state it released in. Not only was it functionally iffy at the best of times with rampant bugs, but also just wasn't actually a fun game. Things seemed way too based on your mana points to allow you to do anything, and stuff which should make your population happy, like freeing them from slavery, in fact just pissed them off, because, well, I could only assume they prefer slavery to taxes. You could also even do other stupid things, like forcibly convert all of the Jews to your pagan religion, and not only were there no penalty for doing so, 
they'd also be much happier for it because now instead of being a religious minority, they were all part of the big happy state religion. With every mechanic being boring, buggy, or both, it was very heavily disliked by the Paradox community, and even to this day has only managed to claw its way back up to a mixed rating on Steam. Not that it matters now, as even after a couple of patches, free content, and then finally starting to release some DLC, which made the game better, but not overall worth it, the development on Imperator was stopped in May 2021. That means it's become a dead game, and everyone who brought in, myself included, has just sort of wasted their money here. It's a shame too, as I'll emphasise a quick point, that there's no number behind the Rome bit of the game's title. This was the first shot at it, and while it's a super interesting period of time, it's unlikely we'll see a sequel with proper mechanics any time in the near future from Paradox. Ultimately, what we saw with Imperator was a worst case scenario. In the complete 180 from that, we can look at Crusader Kings 3, which not only launched to very positive reviews, but also relatively bug free. On top of that, I'd estimate it had roughly 70% of the total content that its predecessor had over the course of its seven year life, on top of brand new and interesting systems around, say, your dynastic line and how intrigue works. The positive launch of Crusader Kings 3 promises fans that the first upcoming DLC, The Royal Court, would be worth buying into. However, are all DLCs worth buying? Let's have a look at how Paradox has actually handled that DLC content. Well, first, we should define what makes a Paradox DLC good in the first place as it's a little different from normal. For the vast majority of games, the downloadable content is either an expansion story that's self-contained, like we see in Borderlands 3, or it's a straight addition to the game, like in the case of Civilization VI. However, when Paradox releases a DLC, it also comes alongside with free LC changes. Every expansion, regardless of if you pay for that expansion or not, will change the game. So, when these are released, the value comes from both the free and paid aspects. The way they do provide value is by focusing their attention on a specific area of the world, or a particular mechanic, and then adding a ton of depth within it. The other thing a Paradox expansion needs to do is just not break the game too much, as they're making sweeping changes to the game for everyone. Europa Universalis 4 is an excellent example of what makes or breaks a DLC, as there are 14 expansions, on which I'll only focus on a couple of examples from there within. Otherwise this video will become both far too long and more of a DLC review than anything else. Speaking of, there are entire videos dedicated to what DLC you should get for not only EU4, but pretty much all of the Paradox games as people understand that checking out a game and seeing a $560 price tag is a little intimidating. With that said, let's look at the second last expansion called the Emperor Update, which focused on Austria, the Holy Roman Empire, and Catholic Europe more generally. On the free side, there were some major changes with a reworking of the map of Central and Western Europe, a rework to the estate, mercenary, government reform, and a little sprinkle of new flavour for nations throughout Europe, as well as a host of quality life changes like seeing who's declared you as a rival when you're choosing yours. On the actual paid side, they fleshed out the features of Catholicism, the Pope, the reaction to the Reformation, and they gave Bohemia the Hussite faith, which is best known for war wagons and the first defenestration of Prague where they threw the town cancel out of a window for not releasing Hussite prisoners. They also overhaul how revolutions work in the late game, add in hegemonies where if you become powerful enough in a certain category, you get very powerful buffs, and then new missions and flavour for 20 nations, which incidentally are the ones most played. Now on the balance, that doesn't sound that bad of a difference between free and paid content for a new patch, but when you do a little more detail on what the paid features actually do, they flesh out the mid-game with the reformation changes, they end the game with revolutions and hegemonies, and then give the nations that people really love to play, like Austria, the most time and attention. The free stuff, while important, and the Emperor patch likely has some of the most significant free changes in the 14 expansions, released are pretty much all the base things required for the paid features to work coherently. Now if you multiply the differences between free LC and DLC over the 14 expansions, you can start to get a feeling for why the base game might become incredibly bare in comparison to the game with all of the DLC. There's a very popular video called Break Europa Universalis 4 by not paying $200 for DLC from a YouTuber called ISO Productions, which currently has over 530,000 views. And if you want an entertaining showcase on just how cursed no DLC had become two years ago, let alone now, then that's where I'd suggest you go. 
So we can establish that the longer Paradox games go on, the more important the DLCs become, and thankfully for your wallet, most of the time an aficionado of these games will either be paying as they release, so it's a pretty slow burn of cash, or if you really trust your mates you can pitch in to get someone to buy them, and then they can host a game so everyone in the lobby has DLC, which does mitigate this issue a lot if you've got those trustworthy friends. This disparity between free and paid content however isn't the only issue impacting the game, as either way these patches also have a significant impact on gameplay in more unexpected ways. In the Emperor update, it was only really making Austria as a nation ridiculously powerful for a human player, and many people used this to rack up a few normally very difficult achievements. While disliked, this wasn't truly game breaking. However, now it's time to talk about Leviathan, the expansion that broke the game for more than a month and took the bottom spot as the worst reviewed game on Steam, taking the title away from Airport Simulator 2014. When I'm talking about breaking the game however, I truly do mean it. As a quick example, normally your leaders can have between 0 and 6 in 3 different stats, which is incredibly important to the balance of the game. During this update, you could very easily give yourself a leader with hundreds in one of those 3 stats, which naturally threw out the balance just a little bit. The primary cause for it being released in this state seems to be entirely tied to the EU4 team themselves. It appears shortly before the development of Leviathan that a new branch of the company called Paradox Tinto, based in Barcelona, Spain, was going to take over development of Europa. Johan Andersen, who is both the studio manager at Tinto and game manager of EU4, is quoted in a forum post to have said, I should have delayed the start of the development of Leviathan until we had all of the resources we needed and had the proper time to onboard the project. We should have taken a break after Emperor's release until the team was ready to start designing and working in early 2021. He did also further in the same blog post admit to the string of low quality releases for the game and took personal responsibility as the manager of the project for these failings, on top of doubling down on community communication and announcing his plans to stop development of new expansions in favour of fixing all legacy bugs still in the game. Post Leviathan, these promises have been kept. It's only now, after more than five months of bug fixing and development, that we're even starting to hear about the next expansion lined up for the game. The state of this expansion and associated patch when it releases will be one of the biggest factors in regaining much of the trust lost in Paradox in the recent years. Johan's response and actually taking responsibility, which seems a rare trait in the modern games industry, was a very good call, but must, as always, be backed with those results. Another Leviathan would cause some serious heads to roll, as the issue with their business model is that you could just cause the game to become unplayable, or heinously unbalanced, which is never a good look for the company. So, as a developer, you can look at Paradox in many ways. When they release a base game, if it's popular, then they'll support and nurture it for years. Each expansion fleshes out the game and the complete package is some of the most incredible gaming experiences you can have, especially with a few other friends to help push the craziness. On the other, they'll abandon projects if they think it's failed and are more than willing to release only half-ready DLC, presumably to keep up with their own financial timelines and projections. Before I move on, there is another aspect I'd like to touch on before closing out the discussion on Paradox the developer, and that is the features that they have nothing to do with. The mods. Well, it doesn't take too much time digging into the Steam Workshop to find that most of Paradox games have an absolute myriad of mods, everything from tiny balance changes to complete redesigns. If you want to play Skyrim's Windhelm in EU4, go for it. You want to play as Prince Arthur's in Crusader Kings 2, there's a mod for you. Have you thought, you know what Fallout needs? A map game. Then go no further than Hearts of Iron 4. From my understanding, a lot of people who want to actually start out modding go to Paradox games as they're actually very easy to mod and play around with. They're kind of a gateway drug to modding. Although interestingly, another important thing is that they've also partnered with Microsoft to actually bring modding to Paradox games on the Xbox as well. So to say that they're very supportive of it would be an understatement, and all their games benefit immensely from this policy. Regarding the games that Paradox has published, I'm afraid this section will actually be pretty short. Paradox has been a pretty reliable publisher. There's only one game that I can recall that was dropped after multiple delays due to quality issues, Vampire the Masquerade's Bloodlines 2, where they dropped Hard Suit Labs as the developer of the project for delays and quality reasons officially, as the game was originally announced in late 2019 for an early 2020 release, and then after multiple delays, they were finally dropped in early 2021 from the project, which still hasn't been released to this day. 
Outside of that, Paradox has seemed to be a solid publisher to work with. They've got a pitch the game to a section on their website that if you fit their criteria for more or less strategy and organization related games, you could get yourself published through them. But that does bring up the brief point of what they actually do as a publisher. From their website, they specifically mention that their responsibility as a publisher includes funding, producing, marketing and selling the games. It also has the primary responsibility of customer contact and growth. This can further be expanded upon from a Reddit post from eight years ago where Shams Jorjani, who is currently the Chief Business Development Officer for Paradox Interactive, added on top of that list that they help with QA, design, focus testing, clear hurdles so devs can work on games, offer input on business stuff, and help them avoid the mistakes that Paradox has made in the past. He ends that post by saying overall that the plan is to have developers do what they're best at, making games, and what we do best, marketing and selling games. This is especially relevant as they tend to work with smaller developers and indies who don't have the capacity to market or sell their game to the fullest potentials that their games might have. There's definitely a philosophy about Paradox where they only want to make games that they want to play and only want to publish things that match what they want to play, which does appear to be a consistent theme that they stick to. It's just a shame that occasionally they break their own games, although to be fair, it appears mainly their E4 team is the weak link in the quality and also their newer games going back to Imperator Rome. Next thing on the chopping block is I'd like to discuss is the company's communication. Communication in general is a super important aspect that most people in just life don't get. So how good is Paradox at it? Well, not too bad if you keep up with them. For the most part, they appear to do most of their communication through their own Paradox forums, which is where they post most of their game updates. This includes all the patch notes, change logs, dev diaries for new games and expansions. They do naturally also maintain social media presences on Twitter, Facebook, and even Reddit to tell people about some of the games and sales they've got on. But the forums are where the real meat of the information they release is. Being said, however, they do appear to be branching out on to YouTube with the development of Victoria 3, with all the current dev diaries being done on their official channel. This is likely because it doesn't have an established audience in comparison to the other games, as Vicky 2 was released all the way back in 2010, and its last expansion was in 2013. So it's become more of a cult classic grand strat than a mainstay Paradox product. The last note is mainly around how they announce their games, as they have their own dedicated convention called PDXCon, which is hosted in late May. This is where they love to dive into their own content, have challenges for their current games, normally have a free-to-play weekend running for all of, all of their games, which is when, if you have that friend with the DLC like I mentioned earlier, it becomes a fun multiplayer game to dive into, and it's also here where they announce the new games. The Victoria 3 announcement was done this year and was appropriately hyped. In a bit of context, this is the grand strategy equivalent of Valve announcing Half-Life 3. It was a prolific meme in the grand strategy community, and you can go back to some videos of prominent Paradox game YouTubers like iSorry Productions or Bacoa 1, where they make this joke multiple times. So Paradox are definitely on top of their own jokes. So now we come to the end to look at all the points and give out a score. If you asked me two years ago where I'd put Paradox on that scale between pre-order to never order, I'd have said pre-order every time. But after the last two EU4 expansions especially and the release of Imperator Rome, I can't confidently recommend them anymore. On the other hand, Crusader Kings 3 released exceptionally well and they have had a complete shakeup of the company after Imperator and the release of EU4 Leviathan. Now there are a few bonus points up for grabs for them in the near future. The first is in the DLC category with the next EU4 expansion that's currently in the works. And if that releases in an acceptable state while also not breaking the standard game, they'll recover a lot of respect. The second will be in the base game category with Victoria 3, which as a sequel should have a lot of ideas already baked into it, which people they know like. So as long as they can make that functional and fun, they'll get even more points. When it comes to their DLC policy more generally, these games are expensive in the long run, and the quality of life changes and fundamentally cool things in the expansions add to the games an immense amount, which requires you to really fork up the cash for them. However, as only hosts require the DLC for multiplayer to work, these expansions go on huge sales very regularly, and they also do still update the game for free on top of those expansions. I do have to give them credit where it's due. 
I'll also include their modding policy into this score as certain mods can add so much into the game and play around with systems even more than some of the expansions do, which you can 100% see in total conversion mods. As a publisher, there isn't much to hear, which is, in a way, excellent news. They lose some points for the shenanigans with hard suit labs that we don't fully understand the background of, and a little more transparency would have been nice, although I would guess that our little friend, the non-disclosure agreement, would kind of get in the way of that. And then, lastly, I'll give them a lot of points for communication. Whilst posting on their own forums give them plenty of moderating power to vet any sort of the posts, the content they're releasing isn't in the comment section. Having dev diaries for everything on the development YouTube videos on the development, all of their patch notes with all of the changes they made on top of actually having the humility to admit direct fault and responsibility when issues arise, it's a breath of fresh air when it comes from a corporate entity. So now, the final score. These guys get a final trust score of 80%, on which I'll gladly bump this up to 90 if the next EU4 expansion and Victoria 3 release in good nick. Not enough that I'd pre-order from them anymore, but there is the potential that one day they'll return to that level of trust. The reason I'm being a bit generous to them is as this is the first time they've had a serious slip in quality to an unacceptable level, and they've reacted appropriately to it. We can't give them their points back until they actually produce results that their shake-up in the company actually worked, and we as consumers will actually get the quality releases that we want again. For now though, thank you all for watching. Please like and subscribe below and as I said at the start of the video, let me know if you think this rating is fair, anything I might have missed or just your own experience with Paradox Games. Until next time ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a great day.